Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis, and here's what matters. Over these last few turbulent weeks, we've been talking with those who would like to legislate on your behalf in the U.S. House of Representatives. Our criteria was simple. If a candidate made it onto the ballot, we offered them an eight-minute interview slot. We were fully prepared to discourage partisanship and attacks, but we are happy to report we didn't need to. Each of the candidates we talked with brought their best selves and their ideas on a wide range of issues. Beginning tonight and continuing next week, we'll bring you those conversations. And we should note that to accommodate all the candidates' schedules, we spoke with the challengers first. When it came time to speak to the incumbents, the bailout debate was well underway on Capitol Hill. And so our conversations with the incumbents focused primarily on how they voted on the bailout, why, and what they see moving forward. We went back to talk to the challengers in each race to see how they would have voted had they been serving, and we'll bring you those statements as well over the course of the next two weeks. Tonight, a look at the first congressional district. Congressman Rob Whitman is the incumbent there, having been elected in December to serve out the term of Congresswoman Joanne Davis, who died in office. There are two challengers in the first district, Libertarian Nathan Larson and Democrat Bill Day. We're happy to have Bill Day with us. He is the candidate in the first congressional district from the Democratic Party. Mr. Day, nice to have you with us today. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for being good here. To be here. As you have gone out on the campaign trail, what are you what are you hearing from people? The economy, the economy, the economy. Mm. It's probably over ninety percent of the time that's their main issue. And so as you think about the role of a congressman from the, the first district, uh, what do you think you might do about some of the sub elements of that eco economic picture, uh, per particularly around energy. My goodness, that's certainly something we've been talking a lot about lately. Yeah, well, energy is part of rebuilding the economy. Um, it is time we really pursue alternative energy. And one way I hope to do that is eliminate most, if not all, of the tax giveaways for the oil and gas industry, incentivize alternative energy, and then we're talking about creating jobs mm -hmm. here in the United States. And where are you on the issue of offshore? Drilling? Offshore drilling is something we probably will look at. I don't think we'll be there for 20 or 30 years. It won't make any difference now. Mm -hmm. uh, oil industry, they're business people. They're going to drill the cheapest oil first. And as you think about the other piece of this economic puzzle, and mm -hmm. you, you've, uh, everyone I talked to who's running for office has had people talk to them about housing, about the housing crisis, mm -hmm. about the fact that many people are, are either losing their homes or certainly getting in dangerous territory. Uh, what are your thoughts around that from a candidate's perspective? Well, having been in the housing industry, um, what drives it a lot of time is overbuilding and unregulated lending. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that happen again with, with non-regulation. We overbuild. We get in trouble. So I want to look at bringing back some regulation. Also, it's just sound economy. With, with the economy like it is, that's what's driven this as well. And when you talk about regulation, what kinds of regulation are you thinking Regulation about? on lending. You know, so to eliminate things like the subprime loans. We had it back in the 80s with the SNL crisis when we didn't regulate that. Now we've got it again with the subprime. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think about uh, the issue of education, and mm -hmm. my goodness, that's certainly something that's gotten a bit of short shrift yes. in the national campaign, uh, but certainly something that everyone cares about and is concerned about. Uh, what, are your, what are your positions on education? What would you like to see done differently if you were elected to Congress? As I'm fond of saying, no child left behind needs to be left behind. It needs to be scrapped. Some people are saying it just needs to be drastically overhauled. I say we eliminate that, let people on the local level deal with it. Um, education's a big issue throughout the first congressional district. I'm a huge supporter of the public system. Mm -hmm. I got the endorsement of the Virginia Education Association last year. In what respect are you hearing that it's a huge issue in the first? Just in the sense of lack of funding, primarily. Lack of funding, poor pay for teachers, large class sizes, you hear that all through the first. And of course the first congressional district is such an interesting one because it, it comprises some of the sort of the southern populous mm -hmm. sections of northern mm -hmm. Virginia and then winds right on down to, uh, to connect here into Hampton Roads in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Gloucester, uh, in the Gloucester uh, area and the northern neck. Um, so I, I'm wondering as you look at the, the issues of that that district, it really is a pretty geographically and I would imagine socioeconomically diverse district. It's incredibly diverse geographically, socioeconomically, concerns. This year though, it, there's one unifying factor and it's the economy. I hear it from one end of the district to the other as the major, major concern. And what are people saying to you about the economy specifically? They're talking about one, they don't feel secure in their jobs, they don't feel secure in their housing, they don't feel secure in their health insurance, they don't feel secure in their national 
security. They're frightened. Mm. And so what would you do if you went to Congress to address those kinds of issues? It's real simple. The first basic of any of that is, number one, on the economy, balance the budget and reduce our debt. And it's a real simple equation. We need to do, to track both of those areas. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple matter of I am totally in support of increasing taxes on the wealthy, or really what it is is allow the tax giveaways to the wealthy um, expire. And then also, like I said, eliminate the tax giveaways to the oil and gas industry. And in addition for the debt, we're spending $12 billion a month to occupy Iraq. End the occupation immediately, and we begin to stop the hemorrhaging of cash that, by the way, is debt to China. As you think about this race in the first, uh, the other thing that is important to note about the first is that uh, uh, Congresswoman Joanne Davis had represented the district for a mm -hmm. number of years. Um, she died, uh, I, I think it was probably about a year ago. Mm -hmm. October. Um, uh, exactly, mm -hmm. almost a year ago. Um, and, and so at that point, Rob Whitman uh, got the office mm -hmm. and he's running again. Mm -hmm. um, what? What is it about the first, about representing the first, that really appeals to you? Because I think you live in Warrington, right? Yes, I live well, just outside of Warrenton in okay. Fauquier County. And so what is it that appeals to you about the first district? Well, it's just this wonderfully diverse, beautiful, from, from Fauquier County, out in the, the foothills and the mountains, down to wonderful waterlands, um, all down around the northern neck mm -hmm. in the middle peninsula. And um, it's where I live. Yeah. And you're a licensed uh, professional counselor by training. Well, I was until a year ago, until last year. For right. 10 years, I had a license as a professional counselor. And as you think about uh, that experience and other relevant experience you may have uh, for the first, mm -hmm. what, what do you bring to the table? Biggest thing from my mental health experience is we have symptoms, symptoms in the economy being loss of jobs, loss of housing, loss of health insurance. They're important to, to deal with. But just like in mental health, we need to deal with the underlying cause of the mm. problems. And that, again, I'll go back to it's the budget deficit and it's the national debt. Those are record levels. And long enough, stay there long enough, and you'll create a recession. Just a couple of moments left, but I, I, I want to ask you in the first about the issues of watermen because yes. they're so critical to, to uh, folks who, who live and uh, have earned their livings mm -hmm. along the water. Uh, what do you think the key issues are, and what can Congress do about those? Two, two with the watermen. One is the pollution of the bay. Right. We've done a fairly good job at point of source. We have not done a good job at all with all the other issues of pollution, including all the climate change issues of the carbon emissions that we have. That's their biggest concern. Lately, especially in Virginia, we've had a change in Virginia where now they're restricted on their season where they mm -hmm. can go crabbing. Right. So they've, they're getting it not only from climate change, but now they've been restricted on how often they can even crab. So, so they're struggling. A couple, yeah, they are, they are indeed. Uh, well, Mr. Day, thank you so much for being with okay, us uh, today. You. Bill Day is the Democratic candidate mm -hmm. in the 1st Congressional District, uh, which is, uh, if you take a look at it on the map, it's a very, mm. very interesting district uh, that heads all the way up from the northern neck area all the way up into the southern parts of what used to be the country but is now very much uh, the Washington, D.C. suburbs. We're back in a moment. And joining us now is Congressman Rob Whitman from the 1st Congressional District of Virginia. He joins us from uh, Virginia Tech by satellite. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be with you today. I know it's a busy day for you. You're going to be speaking to the Corps of Cadets and then meeting with uh, President Steger before heading back uh, into the district. So I thank you for your time. I, I wonder uh, clearly the, the issue on the uh, agenda at the moment front and center has to be this economic crisis, which, as you know, based on the uh, word of this week, is that it's now spreading into the entire world economic systems. And I'm wondering how you voted on the bailout and what your thoughts are now uh, several days or a week or so out from the vote on the bailout? Sure. Well, I voted against the bailout, and I had some concerns about it. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that we held those CEOs and financial firms uh, responsible for getting us there. I wanted to make sure, too, the policies that we, per that we pursued with this were making sure that we got to the root of the problem and making sure that we weren't exposing taxpayers too much. Uh, purchasing these securities, I think, was certainly one option. But to me, the better option was uh, either loans or the purchase of insurance to make sure that we could get these assets back on the balance sheets, but also protecting the taxpayers. You know, I agree that we need to do something, but we need to focus on doing the right thing. And we wanted to make sure that going forward uh, that we didn't create greater problems down the road than what we are trying to solve now. So I, that was one of the reasons I had some reservations about it. 
Uh, but you know, going forward, we need to make sure that we lift this economy up from its foundation. The dollars that this uh, bailout program provide will hopefully free up credit, and it's, I'm very hopeful that that will happen. But we have to do things to the lift the economy up from its foundation. We have to help small businesses. We have to help families. I think we have to look very closely at the tax burden on small businesses so we incentivize them to create jobs. We look at things about uh, how they make capital purchases and take some of the burden off of uh, the taxes on capital purchases. Again, to get them to feel confident for them to go back into the market in addition to the lenders out there making money available for them. So I think we have to do things, you know, across the board. We have still a lot of things we have to do to bring this, uh, to bring this country around. And just as you said, we are in a global economy now, and we have to be cognizant of how this country acts with other countries and how our financial policies also interact with other countries. Our policies here need to be uh, friendly to our businesses, but also making sure that we can leverage uh, dollars that may come from other countries that are able to be lent here. So, you know, it's, it's a very complicated system, but we need to make sure we're doing all we can to lift this economy up from its foundation. So as you, as you note, you voted against the bailout. Uh, go Going down the road, uh, there are those who have suggested that there will be the need for additional monies down the road. So as you think about this going forward, uh, what are some, uh, some of the things that you would not accommodate, that you would not accept in, a, in, a, in bills going forward? And where do you hope some of this legislation uh, goes in terms of uh, the way it's shaped uh, to take care of what will clearly be an ongoing situation? Well, I hope as we go down the road that we look more at insurance. We have some great models there. When we went through the savings and loan issue, the Resolution Trust Company issued a form of insurance called net worth certificates that ensured value of these securities and made sure that those dollars got back on the books for these institutions to be able to lend. So I think that's something we ought to look at if we have additional challenges. Also, if more money is needed, we ought to look at loans like we did with, uh, with Chrysler and actually having a, a, a system of loans where we could loan money in exchange for things like preferred stock. So I'd like to see us pursue those options first before we get into, a, again, the taxpayers taking on the risk in purchasing these securities. So if we need more help down the road, I hope we go in those directions and not in the direction of direct purchase. That is certainly a, a more risky option than the other two that I mentioned with loans or insurance. We're talking with Congressman Rob Whitman, who represents the 1st Congressional District of Virginia, and he's joining us by satellite from uh, Blacksburg. Congressman Whitman, you have been now in the, uh, in the Congress for nearly a year. You, of course, uh, uh, assumed the, the spot vacated by the uh, very untimely death of Congresswoman Joanne Davis. I wonder, over the course of that time, uh, if what you've learned that perhaps has surprised you or what you've learned that has, uh, that has per perhaps suggested an area that you'd like to know more about or that you'd like to explore further uh, as you contemplate another term uh, representing the 1st District. You know, coming to Congress from a state legislature and then a background in local government, it's a very different area. Uh, you look at how people uh, interact with each other, it's a little bit different. Uh, the magnitude of things that you have to deal with obviously are different. But in the end, it really is a people bill. And you need to make sure that you deal with people uh, and, and try to find areas of, of things you have in common to make sure you can work across the aisle to get things done. And that's what I've done since I've been there is to really say, look, uh, I want to get to know other members of Congress. I want to get to know what's important to their districts. I want to get to know who they are, what makes them tick, uh, what has brought them to Congress, look in areas that we have in common, in addition to uh, making sure that I understand the process there so I can operate efficiently within the rules of Congress. So, you know, that's, that's been a change in just kind of getting my feet on the ground, knowing people, knowing the process, knowing how to be effective there. Uh, but in the end, it's still a people business. It's very similar to, uh, to a local board of supervisors that I've served on or the state legislature. People send you there and they expect you to get things done. They expect you to work hard uh, to represent their interests there. And the way you do that is to find out where you have things in interest with others, bring those folks to, together, and get things done. One of the areas and one of the constituent groups, I'm sure, that's been very much in touch with you uh, over the time that you have been in Congress is, is the Waterman community, which, as you know, is facing some very, very significant struggles as they attempt to uh, make their living at the water's edge. And I wonder what your priorities are uh, as regards the future of that industry, which is very challenging challenged at the moment. 
It is. You know, it is so important to make sure that we have a healthy bay. Uh, obviously, the economic aspects of that are important, and that relates directly to our watermen, but also the cultural aspects. I mean, the Chesapeake Bay is so integral to who Virginia is. I mean, when people look at Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay is right there as, as the centerpiece. And we have to do all we can to help watermen. I was very proud uh, when the watermen faced this challenge with the reduction in crab harvest to work with the governor to ask uh, Secretary Gutierrez, the Secretary of Commerce, to put in place a disaster designation so we could help those crabbers out through these times of lower uh, crab harvest uh, that, are, that are required through these additional restrictions. Uh, to help them out, to make sure that they can bridge that gap, hopefully to where we can get the crabs to come back. I think what we need to remember from this, though, is that it's a sign of a deeper problem with the bay. It's sort of the canary in the coal mine. It indicates that we have to do something to bring the bay back. And I've been, uh, been very uh, active in that. I put forth a piece of uh, legislation in consultation with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, with Virginia Watermen's Association, to really uh, efforts, uh, to put efforts forth that, that will make sure our bay comes back to where it was, uh, maybe not back when it was uh, during uh, Captain John Smith's time, but at least to where it was, say, back in the late 50s and 60s, which is still the most productive water body in the world. And what we want to make sure is that all the dollars being spent at the federal level are being identified and that every effort is accountable for results. You know, it's frustrating to see uh, that each year when the report card comes out for the Bay, that we're just not making a lot of progress. We're sort it of is, stuck in, in neutral. Yeah, and some people say that that's representative of I, things I getting done. Say, I hate to say this, and I know you cannot hear me well because of the echo in your ear, and I apologize for that, uh, but we do need to wrap it up here. And so okay. I, I apologize for interrupting you, but I know you can't sure. uh, hear me much of any other way. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for being with us from Blacksburg today. Sure. Th thank you very much, Kathy. We're happy to have Nathan Larson with us today. He is a candidate for the first congressional district on the Libertarian uh, ticket. Uh, Mr. Larson, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Good, good to meet you. Uh, you are from Fauquier County, which is sort of the northern end of the district, if you will. And, and as you think about your own experience, this is your first run for public office, is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. What is it that, that convinced you this was the thing to do? Why did you decide you wanted to run in the first? Well, I think that... Uh we need to get the private sector involved in solving a lot of the problems facing America. Uh, private industry is generally more efficient than government because of the presence of competition. Companies know that in order to survive they have to provide a high quality product at a good price, whereas government is a monopolist because it has the power to, to fund its services through taxation. And therefore, uh, if we eliminate taxation and privatize more services, then we'll see higher quality police, defense, courts, transportation, and education. One of the, in education, you, you mentioned that, and there are a number of other issues in which government has great involvement at the moment. So I want to just be sure that I understand your perspectives on these points. When it comes to transportation, how would you go about approaching that, uh, given the philosophy of, of uh, very much a libertarian school of thought that says that the private sector can handle that better? The roads and and particularly the highways should be auctioned off to private investors and the rail systems as well. Interstate um, highways, all right. of that? Mm -hmm. Because uh, especially with highways, a lot of them run parallel and therefore there can be competition between them. So uh, entrepreneurs will have an incentive to make sure that they don't get too congested. And what, another of the advantages of privatization is that private companies have the ability to raise capital quickly. They don't have to wait for appropriations and seek bureaucratic approvals. They can just invest the money wherever they think it's going to have a return on investment. We've seen that a lot of highways like the Dallas Greenway that were privatized, they are, have uh, good flow of traffic and we're seeing good service there. So as you look at issues like the, we just did a program recently on infrastructure issues and bridges and the like, and that's a kind of problem right all across the country. Mm -hmm. um, all of those privatize all of those and that's that will be helpful right and especially bridges it's an easy place to collect tolls because it all converges to one point I know you're a certified public accountant which would make you different than a lot of people in Congress I just read a study that said something on the order of eight uh, only eight or eight out of ten Congress people 
don't have any formal training in finance or business or economics so as you think about your financial backing and your background i should say i wonder what you think about of the bailout that's currently under discussion admittedly if you were elected to congress you wouldn't be dealing with this bailout but generally speaking uh, that idea of, of, of bailouts or or uh, rescue plans or whatever you want to call it how do you feel about those well i think in capitalism it's important to allow businesses to fail in order for it to work well we need to allow capital to flow out of the hands of those who manage money inefficiently and make poor investments so that uh, they won't be in a position to continue squandering money again in the future um, all the things being equal capital will tend to flow toward those who make good investments and therefore our society's resources end up in the hands of good stewards one of the things we're being told about this situation very much relates to housing which is that if if uh, if we don't deal with this issue then we will have a, uh, millions of people out of their homes because their their mortgages are at risk uh, but even before this crisis you know we had issues with affordable housing in this country so how would you go about getting at that well i, th I think we should get rid of the federal subsidies that uh, encourage home ownership too much even in cases. So tax deduction that sort of thing get rid of that I think that we should. It, for a lot of people, it makes more sense to rent, especially the U.S. population. The average person moves once every five years. Um, the interest group that's seeking to keep this kind of incentives in place is often the realtors who get a cut out of every time somebody moves and, uh, and buys a home. So, yeah, I think that we shouldn't bail out this industry or, or subsidize it. It's, mm -hmm. it's better to just let the market do what it needs to do, let the um, recovery run its course. And, and as you think about the particular issues of the first district, which as you know is sort of a, you've been driving all around and I'm sure you know it's a, sort of an interesting district that runs from the suburbs of DC right down into the peninsula of, uh, of here, of this community of Hampton Roads. There are a lot of issues that watermen are very concerned about because they live and make their living on the water. How do you think about the issues that watermen are dealing with from, from your own perspective? What do you think are the greatest challenges for them? And, and what would you tell them about what uh, it would mean to send you to Congress to deal with those issues? Well, the main problem uh, being faced by watermen right now is that the Chesapeake Bay, which they rely on, is not owned by anybody. And therefore, there's no one with an incentive to protect this resource and conserve the blue crabs, for instance, from being overfished. That the solution is to allow private property rights to be established over the bay so that uh, there will be an owner who uh, has that strong incentive mm -hmm. to... Um, so if I had enough money, I could just, I would, would buy the bay and then I would have an incentive to it, create a safe environment and a profitable environment for the people who, who work it? That's right, and, and civil suits could be used to get injunctions against those who are allowing sediment and pollution to go into the bay. And, and this concept is very much a, a part of libertarian philosophy. And I interviewed one of your, uh, your party's candidate uh, for Senate around some of these issues as well. And uh, he talked about eliminating the Department of Education. Uh, and I wonder how you would feel about that. Well, I think it would be a good thing. Uh, education, when it's privatized, rather than having each child go to uh, the school that's in their district, uh, parents could send their child to whatever school they want. And there would be competing schools, different types of schools, much greater variety than we have now. We have just a few seconds left, but what would happen to the people? Uh, you know, we commonly think of this idea of a safety net. What would happen to those people in the structure that you're describing where so much of it was, was privatized? Well, the elimination of taxes will give people more disposable income. So people who are below the poverty level because of taxation will not be anymore. And also people will have more money to give to charities, which help those people. So again, more private sector involvement and, and approach to it in that way. Uh, Mr. Larson, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Nathan Larson is a candidate for Congress from the 1st Congressional District representing the Libertarian Party. And we'll be back in just a moment.
Since we recorded the challenger conversations prior to the bailout, we asked each of the challenging campaigns to issue a statement on that issue. The Libertarian candidate, Nathan Larson, said he would have voted against the bailout because taxpayer funds should not be used to help businesses that have suffered due to their own poor investment decisions. The recovery, Larson said, will run its course more rapidly and smoothly if the government does not interfere. He pointed to Lehman Brothers, a $639 billion investment bank that was allowed to go belly up. Within days, Larson said the good parts of the company were reallocated to various buyers and the bad parts vanished. Shakeouts like this are how we achieve a healthy, efficient economy, he said. Since Mr. Day's interview was also recorded prior to the bailout, we asked him for a statement as well. He said he is 100 percent opposed to the initial bill, but he would have voted for the bill that came to the floor on Friday. That was the one that finally passed. Mr. Day said that bill was still not great, but it was a dramatic improvement. And he said he wants to see re-regulation of the industry and a thorough appraisal of the value of all the assets the government may purchase. Next week, we'll hear from both candidates vying for the second district and from the challenger in the fourth. If you'd like to let us know what you're thinking, send us an email at whatmatters at whro.org. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.